we're just in the beginning of the most powerful leg. The sharpness of the move confirms the fact that it's really ready to rock and roll. We're in the right place at the right time. Don't lose faith. If you bought a little bit high this year, I don't think you're going to have to worry about it. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, November 29th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, November 29th, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. As always, if you are new to this channel or you haven't already done so, please do subscribe. Hit the bell to be notified of new updates and give us a thumbs up. If you like what we do, we truly do appreciate your support. David Morgan, the silver guru, is our guest today. David is the publisher of the Morgan Report. He's also the author of The Silver Manifesto and Second Chance, How to Make and Keep Big Money from the Coming Gold and Silver Shockwave. And we're delighted to have him here again as a return guest. It's time to saddle up and silver up for David Morgan. David, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? Patrick, I'm doing good. And Patrick Vieira, it's good to see you again. It was nice to see you on that forum with uh, Andy Sheckman and all. We did that little roundtable discussion recently, and I loved it. It was uh, it went better than I expected. So anyway, back to you. Yeah, it was it was pretty great. I mean, I, I look at the thumbnail and I still can't believe my my photo was up there with yours and and all the other guys. I'm like, is is this for real? You know, just pinching myself. But um, I I was glad to be a part of it, and it was good to have you there as well. Um, David. You are the silver guru and the veteran of the precious metal space, and you've seen your share of rallies and crashes in the silver price over the years. You've witnessed how people behave when prices are rallying and running, and then you've also seen how people behave when prices are crashing. It seems the concept of buying low and selling high, it, it's almost impossible to do. For you, how do you advise investors or your members when their belief in an asset is shaken by their experience of the price action in the short term? Well, it's very tough. I mean, uh, I'll give you a, a real life example. I won't use any names. I've got a gentleman from India that's been with me probably a decade or more. And I'm not really sure how much he trades. I really prefer most people to just stack. I mean, if you Go back to the 10 rules of silver investing that I wrote so many years ago. It basically says, you know, start small and accumulate. Dollar cost averaging is really the best for almost everyone. It takes the emotion out. And as long as you're in a major bull trend, you're going to do fine, you know, if you hold on to the end, so to speak. So let me start with that. And that's good information. It's in writing. I wrote it and, and it works. Most people won't do that. Some do, of course. And so they try to buy low or they think they're buying low. And it's very difficult because my experience is that gold bugs are oh somewhat different than, let's say, the average investor. Once you learn the story behind the precious metals, then usually you start to realize, you know, the problems in the current system, which, of course, is just a cycle. It's happened before. It'll maybe happen again. Who knows? And then silver seems to be gold on a different level where the emotional makeup of a lot of major silver investors, I mean, talking where their primary investment is either all silver or mostly silver, not all of them, but generally speaking, they're even a little more wrapped up than the, uh, than the gold bugs. So what do I do? Well, for this gentleman in India, you know, he, he's a long-term investor. And I said, buy, and silver's around 18, you know, um, I said, buy all that you want for, you know, the rest of your life. I didn't really say that. I said, buy all that you want, you know, from this point forward under $20 us, which would be pretty good advice. You know, now, of course it hit that 12 in March. It only stayed there for what a couple of trading sessions or one trading session. And that was at 14 for, you know, a few days or a week or two, I forget, but not for very long. And, you know, from a long-term perspective, if silver is going to 100, for an example, and the bulk of your silver is bought at 20 or less, that's a five-bagger, and that's not bad. 
so that's kind of what I do, but keeping the emotion out of it is really difficult for most people. I certainly was emotional about the silver market when I first started. Now I jokingly say I have ice water in my veins. I mean, there isn't too much that could go on the silver market that upsets me because I've seen it too many times. I do try to prevent the damage and try to mitigate, you know, whatever, but, uh, and there's lots of ways to trade. I had one fellow pretty angry with me a few years back because I didn't get right on a leverage position when uh, he thought it was appropriate. And really it was, I mean, you can look backwards and say, oh, that's the bottom and you didn't call it and you should have been in there. And, you know, for maximum profits, he was correct. The problem is that bottoms are pretty tough to pick and it depends how you trade and all these other factors. So I'm probably belaboring the question, but the main thing is to keep the, your eye on the ball. The ball is there's a fiat currency destruction that's taking place globally. Precious metals always protect you. Gold is basically the standard. It will preserve your wealth. It always has, it probably will this time. Silver, on the other hand, has been demonetized for over a century, yet it still acts as a monetary metal in times of crisis. So it's up to you to determine how much is enough it's up to you to determine if you're happy buying it at 30 and a major bull market, that's gonna look good, especially if it goes to 100, but how about if it goes to 300 or 600 or whatever? So those people that bought it at the all time high, if they're patient and have conviction, really in the long term should come out fairly well. I learned that in, from my own experience and also intellectually learned it from uh, Jim Dimes, the original gold bug. He showed since I went through the first bull market that if you'd bought everything at the high and held on, you'd still come out good. And you know what? Okay, that, that's true. Maybe some of the stocks would go to zero or some of the speculations. But if you had a fairly balanced metals portfolio and just had your conviction, you'd do okay. Yeah, you could whine about, you know, God, I bought it all at 30. I spent all of my cash. I could have bought it at 15. Wah, 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 wah. But, you know, you're going to be one of the few that actually has precious metals when at the top, everybody's going to want to buy it from you. For investors, the emotions aside, would you say that two more important qualities would be knowledge and patience? Uh, yeah, you just summed up my blather in a couple <laughs> words. Very good. Yes, I, I would. Uh, you know, David, we the, the silver price, I mean, it still seems to be in somewhat of a correction since September and it's moving it looks like sideways in the last few weeks. It, it's almost as if the, the market is kind of undecided which, which way to go. What catalyst do you think the market is waiting for before we see the next significant move in the silver price? Yeah, that's a tough question, but I will feed back what you said. It is what I call an indecision pattern. You said it doesn't know which way to go. And this is where there's equal buying and selling pressure. So that there's 50% are bullish and 50% are bearish. So it basically goes sideways. If it goes down slightly, I mean, it's slightly more bearish. And this is all done in the futures market as I would presume that most people watching SBTV understand that. Catalyst is hard to predict, but it'll probably be something in the financial markets that scares people, puts them back into the crisis mode and makes them think I need a safe haven. I can't really forecast what that will be. It could be a number of things, you know, more social unrest, a political outcome. It could be something the Fed does or doesn't do. It could be something the European Central Bank does or doesn't do. It could be something that happens in uh, the cyber world with a cyber attack. I mean, there's so many vectors, uh, Patrick, that, you know, I don't know, but something, uh, and, and it doesn't, it, at this point, it would take a lot. When you're in this indecision pattern, it usually takes a pretty good kick to get it moving. And then once the market gets, let's say, alerted or more high strung, then a little bit can move it fast. So it's really interesting how markets move. It's much more on psychology than most people understand. Uh, the rally in the silver price between March and September this year was exceptionally sharp. And I looked at the uh, the monthly chart for the silver price action, and it almost mirrored the end stage of the last bull market in the late 2000s. What are your thoughts on the sharpness of this rally? And it is it a clue of where prices will be in the months ahead? Well, no one's asked me that. Excellent question, in my opinion. 
Yeah, what it does is it confirms a couple things. One, it confirms that we're in the third leg, which I've been saying for years. Secondly, it confirms that the sharpness of the move confirms the fact that it's really ready to rock and roll. And so it's just absolutely verification of what I think we're doing in the silver market specifically and in the markets generally. So basically to me, the way I read it, it's confirmation. The next leg up will be the most powerful. It probably won't be the longest in time. And that we'll all call it a mini parabolic move that you're referring to was just a taste, a foretaste of what we're going to see at some point in the future. Okay, so before we get there, do you think we're going to see another maybe few months of this this sideways movement? Yeah, we could. We could see all of you know November, all of December. I think we're going to get a rally in the first quarter of 2021. And I'm really thinking the peak could be somewhere in 2022 or 2023. Uh, Mike Maloney of GoldSilver.com did a an update. Uh, oh, I don't know about a month ago, and he did a projection based on the previous uh, gold move and the overlay was almost identical and when he did the overlay it projected I forget the number of what gold got to but the date I think was November 2023 Uh, and that was you know it doesn't mean it's going to happen but it did show that these markets do move in cycles and so that's that's what we're looking for and um in your opinion, where do you think we're at in this this silver bull market right now? Is it still in the accumulation phase, the public participation phase, or the final mania phase? Well, we're certainly not at the mania phase. We are in the third leg, and we're kind of in the stealth phase of the third leg. You know, a lot of people, and remember, these bull markets climb a wall of worry. So there's somebody out there that bought at 28, paid a very high premium because there was just extreme premiums in the retail market for several weeks. And they're sitting on that silver right now and they're starting to lose conviction. You know, it's like, wait a minute, I paid 28, I paid $6, I paid 34 my cost. And now we're sitting at 24. If I had to sell $10 out of 34, that's like a, you know, 35, 40% you know, loss. You know, my wife's mad at me. I'm mad at myself. I mean, all these thoughts go on. Again, going back to more psychology in the markets than most people stop to consider. But overall, we're just in the beginning of the most powerful leg that will, in my view, go in the record books. I mean, this whole monetary reset is just starting. And where it's going exactly, I don't know if anyone knows. I've certainly been writing about it both in the... uh, mostly in the private part, the paid subscribers or members, but I've also said a lot in the public domain and it's a CBDC, the buzzword, the trending thing, central bank digital currencies. And then we'll probably go to a cashless system at some point. So everything is gonna be digitized. What will silver do in that environment, silver and gold? Can't know for certain, but they probably will still hold their value or go up. I really believe they'll go up in price And their value will be commensurate with what we've seen at previous tops, which means, you know, two ounces of gold buys the Dow Jones Industrial Average or, you know, so much gold buys an acre of land in, you know, Manhattan or whatever. So we're far undervalued in both the metals right now. And I think they will regain that. The other part is twofold. One is it's still the most private transaction you can make. I hope I'm not upsetting any of our viewers, but if you go back to uh, John Wick movies, which some of you've seen, or maybe some of you haven't, but when they do the cleanup, what does he pay in? Pays in gold coins, right? After the uh, disaster takes place and the cleanup crew is called by a, you know, a burner phone, they come in, do their job, and he just goes clink, 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 and gold, and that's the end of it. So there we go. Sorry, folks, for my, uh, my handsome face, and that's a joke. Uh, the sun's just coming up here in Washington. It's fairly early in the morning. I can't really correct it without uh, shutting the shutters, and then I wouldn't be able to see the video at all. So you have to put up with the, with the video. Uh, no, no worries. David, you mentioned the, the CBDCs, the central bank digital currencies. It, do you have an opinion on if if it may have some type of a, a, a gold asset back allocation for, for the CBDCs? 
Yeah, I'm reformulating that, Patrick. I mean, if you asked me five years ago, I'd say it's almost a certainty. Right now, I'm not so sure. I know what they want. They want to do it without any backing, but it may not float. And maybe there'll be a competitor. Maybe the, and China's already going to the digital yuan and they're paying people rewards just for coming on board. So it's sort of a bribe. That's my word, not theirs, to get on board the uh, digital yuan. So they may, tied to gold. I mean, they got a pretty good gold hoard. So if they do it, then other central banks will probably be uh, forced to do it. So I, I think it will happen, but I'm really not as convinced as I was, let's say, you know, five years ago, but we'll see. Okay. You know, despite the, the correction in gold prices in September, the World Gold Council reported that gold ETF holdings increased by 68.1 tons or about 2% of assets under management. Global gold ETF holdings have also reached new all-time highs of 3,880 tons. How significant is this development in global gold ETF holdings to you, and does it signal anything to you? Well, it signals the, the end of the fiat experiment one more time. So as the crisis continues on a political, geopolitical and monetary levels, there's going to be more safety seeked by individual investors, money managers, family offices, you name it. And what you just said is all true, of course, but it pales to what happened in the silver ETFs. I mean, the silver ETFs have gone absolutely bananas this year. And I think it's a precursor I keep you know, reiterating is that the next leg up is going to be more powerful and it's going to really surprise a lot of people, in my view, because uh, we're basically are just getting warmed up. It's still as odd as it may sound to people that follow the silver market fairly closely that are worried about that $28 silver and thinking, oh, man, did I make a mistake? Uh, you may have to wait a few more months. I'm not saying you won't. But I do believe strongly that we're going to see something way beyond that in the not too distant future. And again, I think, you know, I don't know if Mike Malone is correct or not, but in his projection, you know, November 2023, so all of 2021, 22, 23. So you've got like three years to go in a market that gold started in 2000 and silver started in 2020 or um, 2003. So that would be a 20 year market for silver and a 23 year market for gold. Okay. And you're um, looking at the last two or three years of it. So you're looking at about the last 10% of the time. And that's all you really got to be in to make really sizable gains. You know, silver gave some notice of what it can do with its huge run up earlier this year. And uh, Guggenheim Investments Chief Investment Officer Scott Maynard said earlier this year at, at Davos that silver prices are likely to go exponential again. And it did just a few months later. Do you think smart money will have a hand in the next breakout again? Yeah, that's a very good question. It's, it's going to be buying demand, whether you'll see institutional buying or not. You know, I'm not saying that, uh, he, you know, Scott Maynard's at Guggenheim isn't really institutional. I mean, someone might classify it that way. I really don't care what name you put on it. I'm talking more of conventional in, uh, institutional. I think there will be some. There's little doubt that, you know, some pension funds will move into it. Some money managers will move into it. But silver is such a small market, and Scott knows that, that it won't take much. I mean, I had a fund manager that managed a fairly significant amount, call me from uh, Hong Kong, in Asia at least, I think it was Hong Kong. And we had quite a lengthy discussion. He was quite a student of the silver market. And he was pretty excited because he basically said, um, if, an, if a nation state wanted to basically get a handle on, uh, I'll call it monetary control, my words, not his, that silver would be the way to do it. And he wanted me to write a white paper with him or anonymously for him to explain kind of the long-term view of silver as a monetary asset and what it would mean if it were to occur again on a national level, which of course would be so significant, you wouldn't be able to believe it. But I think what will happen, and this is a little biased because I'm involved, but a, crypt, a good crypto that's backed by silver 
uh, could put it in a different context instead of what are the institutions doing? What are the, what's 2% or 5% of the world's population doing? You got to remember that silver is absolutely very difficult to obtain in almost any place outside of North America. So if you've got a worldwide cryptocurrency that's backed by silver and you can just do it over your phone, especially with the millennials being as adept at using their phone for almost anything on the web, you've got a situation that basically the bankers never thought of before. And that could be something that could be so significant that only the outliers such as myself would be thinking about it at this point in time, but uh, couldn't get that, you know, hundred monkey thing where, you know, once a hundredth monkey picks up and washes the coconut, and it's a metaphor, I don't know if this is true or not, they all pick it up. So it could be in that sort of exponential phase where, you know, these uh, gold and silverback cryptos uh, just are sort of an oddball investment, and then all of a sudden it's like the place to be, and it, there is opportunity in, in both the metals. So that's kind of the way I look at it. I do, I do know that there'll be institutions involved, but okay. you know, I want to go one step further. Sorry, I know I'm over talking this, but I had somebody call me that um, is quite financially adept, and he asked me this was way back in the 2008 crisis. And he said there was a family such and such, you know, just say they're in the Middle East and they wanted to do, uh, you know, asset reallocation due to the 2008 crisis. And so what do you think they should do? And me being the instant silver bull, I said, well, silver. And he said, okay, fine. Now they've got 1% in the silver market. What do they do with the rest of their money? And that's sort of where we're at. You know, it's sort of like the Berkshire Hathaway story, 20% of the world's above ground supply and it was less than 2% of the silver market. So there's a heck of a lot more, you know, liquidity floating out there than could ever go into the silver market. But the few that do do it are probably going to outperform gold investors by far, in my, in my opinion. Do you think that uh, the investment demand for silver and even fears of a currency debasement will have a greater influence than, let's say, the industrial demand on the silver price? Well, that's a, another great question. I mean, normally the investment demand's been like 15, 20 percent. Depends how you measure it. If you measure it just with commercial bars, it's only been about 10 percent of the market. If you use silver bars and coins, which of course is silver investment, I'm just saying the way that the silver studies measure it, you're like probably at 20 percent. This year it's been more than 50 percent of the market. And 50% of the market at least is in industrial demand. So you still have silverware and you still have silver jewelry. So we're going to be in a pretty good deficit in 2020. And I think we're just getting warmed up. So if gold's ETF was setting a record this year and silver's ETF was definitely setting a record this year, what if that happens for 2021 and 2022? And I believe it will. And so, yeah, the answer is we're in the right place at the right time. Don't lose faith. If you bought a little bit high this year, I don't think you're going to have to worry about it. Yeah, some good words. Good words. Um, more of your words. Can you share with us more behind the <clears throat> the thinking of your recent article on the Morgan Report where you shared about the pursuit of the unattainable carrot? Yeah, that was uh, a, a um, that was a talk that I did with somebody on the net. I forget who, but the idea is that you're just running in place. I mean, the more they're pumping money into the system the more it seems like you're getting somewhere. But if you step back and look at it objectively, you're just running faster and faster and faster, but you're staying in place. That's what the metaphor means. And that's where we are. I just did my podcast before the interview, as you know, and I explained it a little bit more on that. So if you're interested, just go to the morganreport.com and go to the blog, pull down the blog and look at the weekly podcast and you'll hear it. it's not uploaded to the web yet. I just did it, but it'll be available probably by Sunday afternoon. And I go through a very brief talk on what, what the crack up boom means. And it's just, as that metaphor says, they can print all they want from this point forward. It's really not going to do any good. Now, I want to be careful here because there's people getting checks from the government without them. They'd really be in dire straits. I understand that. But what I'm trying to convey is the system is so broken that that money from the government may be certainly a very important value to you, but it's not going to help you in the long run. The system's too far gone. That's my point.
you've said for a while that everyone should buy a little silver. How compelling is the case to buy silver and how much is a little silver? Yeah, yeah you're going back. We had a little chat off air. Yeah, it's actually not me. I, I made a, a, a video years ago. I think it's got like 200 something thousand views. And maybe it's that Google always messes with your metrics. But regardless, it's one of the more popular ones I did. And what I said in that video is that dealers will tell you, you know, not necessarily Mike Maloney, but those, you know, bullion dealers, you know, I don't want to name too many. Uh, I, I'm friendly with most of them, but, you know, Miles Franklin, goldsilver.com. Uh, Silver Doctors, JM Bullion, all these outlets for retail silver. And go, and this really was poked more at the last bull market than this one. But if you go back in the, as old as I am in the 70s and early 80s, these dealers would say, well, I think everyone should own a little gold and silver. That's the statement. And I said, well, that's a ridiculous statement. Here's why. Because if everyone should own a little, how much is that an ambiguous term? How much is a little? And who's everyone? Another pretty ambiguous term. So I looked at it and I said, look, if it's a little, I'm going to use two ounces of silver as a little. And I'm going to use a little for everyone. Instead of everyone, I'm just going to use the population of the United States because I want to go through this metaphor or this analogy, rather, what, what, if everyone owns a little, what that would mean. So the population of the U.S. at the time was less than it is now, but now what is it? Um, 350 two, is around there. 260 million or something. Anyway, I just did round numbers. So I got the population of the United States times two ounces of silver at that time was basically all the uh, mining activity for, for the uh, world. And I said, how preposterous is that? What that means is only 5% of the world instead of everyone in the world own two ounces of silver and wipe out every ounce that was available year over year over year. If everyone had a little silver and bought, you know, a little each year for three or four years. So I said, not everyone can own a little and not everyone will own a little, but I just wanted to point out that the statement's rather ridiculous because they never thought it through, but it also shows you how small the silver market is and how little new buying will be required to take it to much higher prices. And of course, we're looking for value, not necessarily price, because at the end stages of the crack up boom, you know, a loaf of bread may be 12 bucks. We don't know yet. We're going to go into that kind of a hyperinflationary mode or not remains to be determined. I think not, but I think that it will be inflationary enough for people to think that that's exactly where we're going to be and that's going to cause the flood out of their savings and into real, real things. And it won't necessarily be silver, although silver will benefit more than gold because it's more affordable. But you'll see a lot of peanut butter coming off the shelves that will be stored or toilet paper or wax paper or, you know, frozen foods or canned foods or whatever. And unfortunately, this can't be stopped. We're at that point, going back to the metaphor with uh, the carrot and the stick and running on the treadmill. These people are running as fast as they can, and then they realize, you know, I got to get off this treadmill, walk on over to the shelf, buy as much, you know, I won't use a brand, buy as much canned soup as I possibly can afford and take it home. Because two months from now, it's probably going to cost me double. That's what's going to happen. They're going to get off that treadmill realize there's a bit of a way out and that's the way to basically protect themselves. And, the, the, you know, so that's, that's my answer. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Amen to that. Um, David, be, before we wrap up, can you let our listeners know more about your work? And of course the, the Morgan report. You bet. The best thing to do is just get on our free newsletter. It's uh, the Morgan report.com. We just verify it's you and not a robot and we'll give you uh, email access to everything I do on the web, the articles, the interviews, and then we uh, feature um, offers from time to time, not that often that might be of interest to you or not. Uh, the blog, of course, and I've got a YouTube channel. And if you're interested in investing in the resource sector, right now we're focused pretty much primarily on gold, silver royalty companies. We've got some uranium and a, asymmetric uh, technology stock. So 
a lot of these top tiers, you already know their names, and that's really where you make the most money safely. So you don't really need it if you can do uh, fairly good stock analysis. And I'll plug my book because you really want to know how to do it on your own and save some money. You can just buy um, the Silver Manifesto and you can get that at the silvermanifesto.com. There's a whole chapter in there, how we pick a mining company. That's not referring to some junior company out in the middle of nowhere that's going to make everybody a billionaire. No, that's not how you pick a mining company. You're talking how you pick a solid producer and how you use the analysis to determine one over another one. Okay, David Morgan, the silver guru, we thank you for coming on the show and I hope we can do this again sometime. Patrick, thank you very much. That was David Morgan, publisher of The Morgan Report. For more of his insights on silver and the global economy, please visit his website, themorganreport.com. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content. And do also check out the SBTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify. 